Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the final seminar for this term of the 2006-2007 Global Science Speaking Series, Subaltern Voices, uh, Speaking and Theorizing for the Academy Marches. My name is Melinda Smith, and I am the coordinator for this year's uh, series. Um, <coughs> as many of you know, one of the things that this series is trying to do is to um, provide a space for discussions about questions and topics that are in my view, not actually explored within the disciplines. I've named it Subaltern Voices in, in, in some ways uh, actually to reflect this kind of tendency. Uh, the speaker we have before us, I'm going to move right into this because I'm not sure that's why we're primarily here. Before us is someone I've known for about six years. Uh, he came to the University of Alberta, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Chakwoyekis, he came to the University of Alberta in 2000 when we had the um, African Society African Renaissance Conference, which we brought Noble Larry Boy showing the year. And he was one of our keynote speakers. And uh, I, as many of the participants during that time, were very impressed with uh, his presentation, but him in particular. And so I'm very delighted that he's actually able to come back to Edmonton. Uh, he's actually enjoying the weather, being from Chicago and all. Um, <laughs> He was going on about how this is about Canada, and I, was, I, I had to remind him that he was from Chicago. Um, so let me just say to you a little bit about uh, Dr. Easy, and then we'll, uh, you have this uh, outline of this paper. But first, I should say that this seminar is co-sponsored by the Department of Philosophy, and we are very pleased that they are able to co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. And I particularly want to thank, thank uh, Phil Corkin, with whom I have worked with this, but also So, <laughs> so we are uh, 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 thank you to the Gloucester Department. Um, Dr. Emmanuel Chapulizi uh, completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at Jesuit Colleges in Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and at Fordham University in New York. And he was educated in Benin City in Nigeria, in Kinwenza, in Zaire, which is now the DRC. He received his master's in 1989 and his PhD in 1993. His doctoral dissertation was on rationality and the debates about African philosophy. He did his uh, postdoctoral visiting scholar at Cambridge University uh, in 1996 and 97, followed by a visiting professorship at the New School for Social Research in 1997. He has taught at Bucknell University in uh, Mount Holyoke College. He has been a visiting professor, as I said, at the New School but also at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Currently, he's an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at DePaul University in Chicago, where he's also chair of the Critical Race Theory Committee and a member of the Interdisciplinary African and Black Studies Program. And his work offers, I think, uh, wonderfully refreshing insights into post-colonial histories of philosophy in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. His intellectual influences, I think, reflect the, his efforts to try and move out of the duality of either African or European or either uh, European or American philosophies. His work, his, his work reflects influences by Rorty, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, among others. What I particularly like about Dr. Easy's work is that it tries to negotiate in a non-reductive way the relationship of Europe's modernity to Africa, particularly as uh, shaped by the coloniality of power, and the kinds of questions he poses, to what extent has European philosophy and anthropology, for example, been instrumental in establishing and advancing the colonial order of things, but also to what extent has philosophy been instrumental in efforts to try and establish European supremacy, African inferiority, this, this, this binary, in a quasi-scientific manner? What is the link between European imperial and colonial expansion of power and the development of science broadly conceived? Dr. Easy's work is important because it tries to make sense and speak to the multiplicities and pluralisms of African historical experiences. It invites African and critical uh, intellectuals of the continent and the diaspora to locate themselves within the polyglot of African realities of the everyday and its relationship and, uh, to uh, the post colonial Africa. I also like it because it raises uncomfortable questions, and I think that's what this series has been all about. 
about the history of philosophy, such as, for example, to what extent is the work about Immanuel, uh, by Immanuel Kant uh, and, and Kant's racialism not just incidental to his work, his philosophy, but actually an important element of the whole, his project as a whole. However, Dr. Easy's work does not allow him, he does not allow himself to fall into good European by European philosophy. Rather, his work poses some important questions about the task of philosophers, uh, including African postcolonial philosophy and political theory. To what extent should African philosophy be conceived? Could be concerned about Eurocentrism, one of the first uh, uh, questions raised by Dr. Hakim Ali in his lecture. To what extent should the preoccupation be about the reconstruction of African oral philosophies or traditions, both literate and non literate? How important is it for African philosophers to develop various systematic approaches or interpretations to, of the various generations of African philosophers, uh, history of African philosophy, if you will? I think it's an all important question. He, he engages in his work. You have this bio of his work, but some of the most uh, important ones, uh, I think, are his, his work in African philosophy, social and political theory, and post colonial studies, including achieving our humanity, the idea of a post racial future, post colonial African philosophy, a critical reader, and race and the enlightenment, a reader. He's also the, uh, the editor of Philosophy of Africa and has written widely on themes related to African politics, history, and philosophy. I hope you will please join me in welcoming Dr. Hatha. A reminder to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. I'm indeed uh, pleased to be back uh, to this university. And I would like to thank uh, all the individuals and departments that uh, worked hard to make this happen and I also want to thank each of you for coming. Um, I approach my presentation today from uh, uh, three stops as it were uh, when people usually raise questions about uh, diversity and rationality or reasoning, uh, most of us are familiar with the debates uh, in, uh, in a state that I call uh, midstream. And uh, the midstream here is usually uh, arguments for or against relativism, whether it's in the way the arguments are constituted in anthropology or whether it is, uh, for those who work from philosophy, the way the arguments were constituted uh, in what was called the rationality debate in the 60s uh, that was very popular in England uh, at one point. Uh, so I will indeed uh, say something that has some relevance to that sort of issues surrounding relativism. But my current interest is uh, upstream and downstream, as it were. The up being, in this case, being a, uh, uh, questions about how the mind works. Uh, I know that's a loaded term, mind, uh, because different disciplines, if you're in neurology, <coughs> it means something else. If you're in biology, it means something else. If you're in philosophy, of course, it means something else. And even if, if you're within one discipline, like the one I know in philosophy, if you do phenomenology, it's one thing. If you do analytic uh, philosophy or intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence is one thing. If you do logic, it's another thing. But uh, knowing uh, the diversity within that diversity, as it were, I, I'm still comfortable to talk about the upstream as such, uh, where, and you see why. The downstream is more uh, 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 historical questions, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes reading uh, works on how historians understand history has been the best way for me to uh, engage other people in that, in what I meant by downstream there, for example, the work uh, 
this kind of work are usually done by hist practicing historians, but almost always when they are retired, uh, then they write like the philosophy of the thing. And, and John Gaddis is one example of that, who just wrote a book uh, that was published by Yale University Press um, called The Landscape of History. Anyway, so what I, what, to, to start then from, from upstream and, and sort of work our way downstream and see how far we get. Uh, 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 I uh, sort of relocate a question that was posed by uh, Virginia Woolf. Uh, she once asked, how is it possible to connect uh, the thing with the meaning of the thing? Uh, if Woolf assigned uh, to fiction writing the task to uh, carry the mind uh, across what she called uh, the chasm, which divides the two without spilling a single drop of its belief. Uh, I ask uh, what in everyday experience uh, allows one to form this belief in the first place? Uh, unlike uh, literary fiction, academic philosophy gets around uh, the problem of grounds for everyday beliefs about things by saying in the classic language of uh, the moderns that uh, one's concept uh, uh, quote mirrors or represents or corresponds uh, to the object. Uh, today, uh, particularly in modern and postmodern uh, social sciences, Others say that uh, discourses, quote, construct or deconstruct uh, and reconstruct uh, the social and cultural worlds that are objects of uh, study. I intend uh, uh, in this section of my talk to first highlight and then complicate uh, the problems involved in, in both the modern and the postmodern ways of talking about things and how we come uh, to beliefs about what things mean. Uh, and since there is a large body of literature on this subject, I will proceed by uh, examining the most recent discussions and, and the outstanding debates. Overall, however, I hope uh, to show how uh, contrary to uh, the sense one might get when uh, eavesdropping on uh, philosophers argue about the issues, uh, the positions assumed in, in these uh, discussions, as well as the resolutions offered to the problems, uh, are inherently uh, tied to what I call vernacular uh, or unstated uh, assumptions. Uh, and some of these assumptions are obviously ethical, others are just uh, aesthetic uh, in character. And one person who, who, who've done some work there, uh, who also recently passed away, it's uh, Bernard Williams, uh, in a series of books, uh, uh, Descartes, uh, The Project of Pure Inquiry, uh, Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy, uh, Moral Lock, uh, as well as uh, Truth and Truthfulness. Uh, Williams developed at least three kinds of the related languages that humans employ in the making of concepts. Uh, there is first uh, the language of science, example in physics, that uh, uh, seeks to present an absolute uh, description of na <coughs> natural states uh, of the world. And uh, the absolute character of this language uh, derives uh, from the fact that uh, physics, like other natural sciences, aims to describe uh, with predictable certainty the universal and uh, non-relativistic uh, laws that govern the natural relations uh, of uh, its objects. So this language of science uh, uh, is different from the language of morality or ethics, for example. Uh, in, in, in this second type of language, uh, the language of morality or ethics, uh, they, 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 uh, what we look for to find is, uh, uh, for example, in general ethics, a, a, a thin uh, description of ethical truths. 
for example, the concept of rightness or goodness or justice. And when the ethical language is contextual rather than general, like the examples I just gave, then we speak of uh, the third kind of moral uh, and ethical discourse uh, that uh, uh, ben liked to, uh, Williams liked to call a thick language in which one makes uh, culturally relativistic uh, moral judgments. For example, when one asks, uh, was it right uh, for the company driver, Joanne, on her way to the office to refuse to give a lift uh, to an unacquainted old lady who had asked for a ride? Uh, uh, while the first type of language allows uh, the physical scientist to explain and predict the behavior of uh, nature on the causal laws. So we study gravity, planes, optics, and so on. The second allows a thinker in one language to make either cross-cultural or intra-cultural moral judgments. And when, whereas the language of intercultural morality is suitable for evaluating behaviors of peoples who live in another culture or peoples who lived in the past, which the speaker could never experientially recapture from an internal point of view, uh, the, the thick language of intra-cultural moral judgment <coughs> is uh, suitable for evaluating uh, social experiences uh, in which one could uh, easily imagine oneself uh, a participant. So uh, uh, here are some problems with these distinctions uh, in language. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in everyday life, most individuals do not use language in the ways a physicist or an ethicist does. And even within the expert community, the languages of a majority of the sciences, especially in the fields of historical, social, and literary sciences, not to mention the yet more ambiguous areas of interdisciplinary studies, uh, do not easily starkly present themselves under the umbrellas of the physical versus the moral. So if William's position on the first type of language, the ideal language of causality in science, inspires itself from uh, uh, the work of others like early Wittgenstein, uh, the Wittgenstein of uh, the Tractatus, uh, his position on the second type of language regarding the possibility of a distinction between general and situational or thin and thick statements in ethics indicate that uh, Williams' uh, philosophy of language kept in view the implications of uh, the arguments uh, of uh, later Wittgenstein, uh, the Wittgenstein uh, we associate with uh, the investigations. Uh, for this later Wittgenstein, cultures and societies are embedded in forms of life within which the internal participants play language games. Uh, language games are intrinsically evaluative. They encode or own, uh, uh, they encode not only uh, cognitive dispositions, but also aesthetic and moral arguments or demonstrations about one or another's motives, actions, and purposes. And within this background, we know that some things are good and others are bad, certain things are just, others are unjust, or some things are beautiful, and others are ugly, and so on. Uh, so what we really do when we play the, the game, we already know, as it were, is to admit uh, uh, that one does not inhabit all possible forms of life, and therefore could only speak as a situated mind. As situated, uh, one's general language cannot be a priori uh, presumed to penetrate the particulars of all possible human experiences. One can therefore speak thickly only where one concretely shares a worldview rather than abstract concepts alone. Uh, to make moral concepts thick and useful at the levels of everyday social interactions requires a shared way of life, uh, whether that be linguistic, uh, religious, political, commercial, and so forth. But th there is also a strong current of uh, uh, relativism uh, uh, in Williams' thinking that may not uh, permit 
or permit, but not to the degree I have just uh, indicated, the optimistic uh, outlook on cross-cultural communication. Uh, the relativism suggests that any cross-cultural judgment, no matter how reflexive and thorough its critical processes, might not be decontextually objective. It admits that cross-cultural dialogue could enlarge the rules of each interlocutor's language game, so that in the development of capacities for newer linguistic rules and norms, the participants may acquire newer cultures. But then, this newer, larger language would also be seen to possess in its own cognitive, conceptual, as well as practical contextual limitations, uh, some of the problems we saw earlier. There is, in short, no hope for the possibility of what you might call a general mind, a mind that is decontextualized of all specificities and hovering uh, from nowhere over all actual and possible experiences of all cultures and all linguistic traditions. For the relativist, humans do not have it, or maybe don't have it yet, in their powers to create a universal language game that will be useful for passing judgments on every habit of every culture. The farthest William could possibly go in this direction is to affirm in the manner of Wittgenstein that moral language games may share across cultures or across themselves family resemblances. But these resemblances are not and could not be strongly cognitive. For example, they could not be serial logical relations. Instead, uh, the relations are historical and genealogical. Um, to pass an evaluative moral judgment on a behavior on the basis of family resemblances in ethical worldviews appears and will always appear to be either of two things. It's to speak thinly and in, general, in generality or to speak thickly but as it were from another place, from the point of view of an other. Neither of these alternatives suggests, however, that such moral judgments are any less valid than one made from within a culture, shared or, 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 uh, or a particular shared worldview. The judgments are sim simply different forms of moral judgments. As such, even for the radical relativists, some morally evaluative cross-cultural statements, however at risk for meaninglessness on account of its general generality, or however interruptive its externality to the addressee, are perfectly possible because ac actors across cultures do believe, for example, that there are, generally speaking, types of behavior one could tell as right and types of behaviors one could call wrong, or that certain types of action can be said to be good, while others are said to be bad, and so on for proper and improper. To engage in arguments, let me drink some water and see if I could get myself to say uh, generality. Um, so, uh, to engage in arguments, even uh, uh, merely conceptually, for or against the binary thinking involved in these pairings uh, of terms, is already to recognize uh, their conceptual possibilities. So what I want to examine, uh, uh, moving on from uh, Williams' work then, is the cognitive status of this idea of uh, the conceptually possible in the various kinds of judgments we make in ordinary social interactions or across cultures. Ultimately, uh, whether one is a believer in rational validity of cross-cultural languages uh, or cross-cultural uh, morality or a relativist in the matter, what is in question for, I think, everyone, with, regardless of the camps, is the cognitive status of the idea of the languages <coughs> of, uh, in this case, morals as such. Uh, can this language uh, 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 what can it do, uh, whether this language is said to be thin, uh, sharing only family resemblances, or thick from the point of view of particular forms of life. Another way of, of phrasing the problem I want to move forward with is this. Is there the possibility of a logical guarantee 
that cross-cultural actors may reach agreement about the rightness or wrongness of most highly specific culturally or linguistically contextual behavior? If yes, what provides the guarantee? If no, why not? These questions are relevant not <coughs> necessarily in the course of primary or reflective levels of social interaction. In fact, one hardly ever notices in the normal course of ordinary lives the logical incongruities and paradoxes that underlie much of human interactions. With the exception of those rare moments when reflection is forced upon actors by a breakdown in rituals that are everyday communications, the significance of a question that uh, I've raised uh, derives uh, largely from the technical domains of reflection and of thought. How consistent are all forms of reason within and across themselves? <laughs> How is the unity of rationality possible? If rationality lacks an inner consistency, except in its most abstract form, example, as pure perception as, uh, or as supposedly super transcendental subjectivity or as merely figures of the minds, timeous uh, woof and weft over uh, a breaching tongue. Uh, these three things I mentioned, uh, they, they refer to uh, a manuscript I did for Duke University Press called, just called On Reason. Uh, I, I hope they can uh, finish the work by the end of next year. But uh, so when I, when I say, uh, when I use these terms, uh, I explain it somewhere, and I, I'm sorry that I'll just have to presuppose here uh, uh, what I mean in the question, how is the unity of rationality possible? That's a question that I don't go in very deeply into here. But in any case, uh, uh, how might, uh, 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 if we work through this context, how might an anthropologist or a philosopher recording and judging the actual activities of a foreign culture have confidence that one has understood the real meanings of a culture or within a culture the thought of another person? How is it ever possible to understand thickly another culture, another mentality, except from, quote, the outside? To say that an understanding or judgment is thick, then is to suggest that it is highly specific and, concept, uh, 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 and contextual, it implies, implying that uh, one has a general understanding of the system of beliefs underlying a behavior, understood or judged, uh, as well as the concrete content of uh, uh, the behavior comprehended, uh, and that one, in one way or another, can uh, almost causally uh, ex account for them in an explanatory relation uh, uh, to each other. So content explains the system of belief, the belief explains why content came about. To make this kind of moral judgment uh, is to imply that one has understood the rational basis of uh, actions directly resulting in a belief system that has been evaluatively or pragmatically comprehended in thought. To be able to make this kind of judgment, the speaker would not only have to have seen what was done, but also had to have understood for what and how it was done from the perspective of the actor. To gain these two later levels of understanding, however, one would need to actually or vicariously participate in the form of life and the language games of the culture and the customs in question. The dilemma here is that once one has so fully and effectively embedded oneself in a culture and in custom, there is no reason to think that given the total social character of culture, as well as of the intentionality of, uh, of uh, uh, cognitive practices, one has not, in those same acts, uh, lost one's, uh, uh, what you might call, one's objectivity. How do we know that the interpreter is not henceforth rationalizing, i.e. understanding in the sense of, uh, to a point of excusing actions authorized by situations otherwise alien from the interpreter's uh, original standpoint or background? If, if, if you want to get a real sense of uh, everyday prob uh, problem involved in this question, I encourage you to read a book that just came out from uh, uh, Princeton University Press by a guy whose last name is uh, Smith. Uh, I, I'm halfway through it because uh, 
uh, I think the book is supposed to appear in January, but I happen to uh, someone happened to share a preview copy with me. But in any case, the book is on corruption in Nigeria. But this person has lived on and off in Nigeria for like the past seven years, married to a Nigerian, and, and the first uh, chapter is his attempt to say uh, uh, how he hates and loves corruption in Nigeria. So in any case, uh, I, 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 I wish I had got the book before I wrote this. Uh, I would have woven it better. But, but it's a real issue that, uh, that's out there, and those of you who do field work in anthropology could probably attest to this as well. I, I want to, 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 to leave the, this midstream part of it behind for now and talk a little bit about another person who raised the, 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 the issue at the level of, uh, I guess, what you might call representability the issue of presentability. And it's really uh, uh, Hilary Putnam in, uh, in, in the book, uh, Representation and Reality. Uh, it was an important book uh, when it came out, it, uh, I think 1991, uh, because it really uh, helped to uh, shake up a lot of uh, what you might call accepted uh, truths uh, uh, in the debate when it came out. Uh, the work argues in substance that the classical correspondence theory of truth is wrong because uh, the idea that a non-psychological absolute fixes references to objects is totally, in uh, his word, unintelligible. Uh, now, the way I translate this position, uh, it, it's more plain, and I think it, it, it says uh, uh, something like this. Uh, that, uh, 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 number one, it denies the idea that somehow it is nature itself rather than the human mind that determines what human words stand for. The correspondence theory of truth, uh, in fact, uh, Richard Rorty also famously called uh, uh, this kind of doing philosophy, uh, philosophy as uh, the mirror of nature. Uh, it, it, according to Putnam, this kind of philosophy requires one to revert to uh, an equally colorful language uh, that uh, he uses, medieval essentialism, uh, in order to account for experience and concept formation. Uh, the, the medievalism, of course, consists in a belief that uh, essential self-identifying uh, objects uh, naturally populate the world and then these essences uh, are uh, the things on the behalf of which uh, linguistic uh, sign relations are built also somehow naturally to match uh, the order of, of the things. Uh, the, the, the contrary non-dogmatic position, uh, of course, is that it is only from human mental constructions of nature that the law-like character <coughs> of nature itself may be known. So to understand the, the, the impact of uh, the work of people like uh, Putnam and Rotti on these issues, on these issues, one, one would have to distinguish between a rejection of the correspondence theory of uh, knowledge of nature on the one hand and an embrace of relativism on the other. They don't follow. Neither uh, uh, option necessarily entails the other. In fact, Pertinem e examined uh, several brands of relativism and ultimately rejected their claims. Uh, uh, instead, uh, what he does is more like uh, another American philosopher, Quine, had done. Quine uh, uh, looked in a different direction uh, uh, for what should be done if one became a post-Cartesian in regard to the correspondence the theory of truth. So, uh, uh, Pertinent uh, rejects uh, metaphysical relativism. Uh, that's important. Uh, he also rejects uh, an idea that most people consider nihilistic, which is to say that you know, there's nothing out there uh, independent of language you know, or independent of language games. Uh, so, despite these two rejections, though, he insists on the fuzziness at the boundaries between the spheres of nature. Uh, in 1996 and 97, followed by a visiting professorship at the New School for Social Research in 1997. 
He has taught at Bucknell University in uh, Mount Holyoke College. He has been a visiting professor, as I said, at the New School, but also at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Currently, he is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at DePaul University in Chicago, where he's also chair of the Critical Race Theory Committee and a member of the Interdisciplinary African and Black Studies Program. And his work offers, I think, uh, wonderfully refreshing insights into post-colonial histories of philosophy in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. His intellectual influences, I think, reflect the, his efforts to try and move other theology of either African or European or either uh, European or American philosophies. His work, his, his work reflects influences by Rorty. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the final seminar for this term of the 2006-2007 Global Science Speaking Series, Subaltern Voices, uh, Speaking and Theorizing to the Secondary Margins. My name is Melinda Smith, and I am the coordinator for this year's uh, series. Um, <clears throat> as many of you know, one of the things that this series is trying to do is to um, provide a space for discussions about questions and topics that are, in my view, not actually explored within the disciplines. I've named this of Alton Morris in, in, in some ways uh, actually to reflect this kind of tendency uh, of this paper. But first, I should say that this seminar is co-sponsored by the Department of Philosophy, and we are very pleased that they are able to co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. And I particularly want to thank, thank uh, Phil Corkin, with whom I have worked with this, but also <laughs> so, <laughs> so we uh, 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 thank you to the philosophy department. Um, Dr. Emmanuel Chapulizi uh, completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at Jesuit colleges in Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and at Fordham University in New York. Uh, he was educated in Benin City in Nigeria, in Kimwenza in Zaire, which is now the DRC. He received his master's in 1989 his PhD in 1993. His doctoral dissertation was on rationality and the debates about African philosophy. He did his uh, postdoctoral visiting scholar at Cambridge University, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, among others. What I particularly like about Dr. Easy's work is that it tries to negotiate in a non reductive way the relationship of Europe's modernity to Africa, particularly uh, shaped by the coloniality of power, and the kinds of questions he poses, to what extent has European philosophy and anthropology, for example, been instrumental in establishing and advancing the colonial order of things, but also to what extent has philosophy been instrumental in efforts to try and establish European supremacy, African inferiority, this, this, this binary, in a quasi-scientific manner? What is the link between European imperial and colonial expansion of power and the development of science broadly perceived? Dr. Easy's work is important because it tries to make sense and speak to the multiplicities and pluralisms of African historical experiences. It invites African and critical speaker we have before us. I'm going to move right into this because I'm not sure that's why we're primarily here. Before us is someone I've known for about six years. Uh, he came to the University of Alberta, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Chakwaliki, he came to the University of Alberta in 2000 when we had the um, African Society African Renaissance Conference, which we brought Noble Larry Boy showing for here. And he was one of our keynote speakers. And uh, I, as many of the participants during that time, were very impressed with uh, his presentation, but him in particular. And so I'm very delighted that he's actually able to come back to Edmonton. Uh, he's actually enjoying the weather, being from Chicago and all. Um, <laughs> He was going on about how this is about Canada, and I, was, uh, I had to remind him that he was from Chicago. Um, so let me just say to you a little bit about uh, Dr. Easy, and then we'll, uh, you have his uh, outline.